Good evening, my name is Gloria McPhail Nixon and it is my pleasure as the Acting Deputy Governor to serve as this evening's Master of Ceremonies. On this day, as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the construction and opening of the Parliament Building, we will do so beginning with the launch of the Speaker's Lecture Series, which tonight features the separation of powers. At the conclusion of these activities, the formalities will then transition outdoors where together with the wider public, our current parliamentarians will remember and celebrate those who came before and paved the way over this half century to fortify our legislative branch of government. Tonight, we begin with presentations that will then spill onto the street before our parliament and which will be accentuated by numerous cultural performances and even some fireworks. But first things first, as we begin, please allow me to acknowledge our distinguished participants and guests who are gathered here this afternoon. His Excellency, the Acting Governor, Mr. Franz Manderson, Premier, the Honorable Wayne Panton, Speaker of Parliament and tonight's gracious host, Honorable Dr. W. McKeeva Bush, Deputy Premier, Honorable Christopher Saunders, our Ministers of Cabinet, the Honorable Juliana O'Connor Conley, Honorable J. E. Banks, and Honorable Kenneth Bryan. Attorney General, the Honorable Samuel Belgian. Deputy Speaker of the Parliament and Parliamentary Secretary, Honorable Catherine E. Banks Wilkes. Parliamentary Secretaries, Ms. Heather Bodden and Mr. Isaac Rankin. Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Roy McTaggart. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Joseph Hugh. Other Members of Parliament, Ms. Barbara Conley. Justice Richard Williams, Guest Speakers, Dr. the Honorable Lloyd Barnett and Mr. Richard Barton. Other Platform Guests, Mr. Raymond Alberga and Mr. Alberga. Former Speakers of Parliament, Former Parliamentarians, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Associate Members, Clerk and Staff of the Parliament, Acting Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Jason Webster, Chief Officers, Heads of Department, and finally, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen in attendance and those joining us via the live broadcast, good evening. As part of the protocols for the evening, I would also like to record apologies for the Honorable Sabrina Turner and Honorable Andre Ebanks as well as MP, Mr. Moses Kirkconnell, and Parliamentary Secretary, Dwayne Seymour. They send their regrets that they're not able to be here in person and also their warm regards. Tonight, as we gather for a lecture on the separation of powers, whilst we are in this hollowed institution, the parliament itself is not in session. It is a very rare opportunity befitting of this rare occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Parliament House. As I gathered, I wondered how we might be reminded that Parliament is not in session, but there are signs all around. The first being that the members were mostly in their seats on time, <laughs> to the constant challenge of the speaker. The second is that the sergeant did not enter the chambers declaring Mr. Speaker as if he loses him at every sitting. And finally, of course, the mace is not present here tonight, which is the symbolic authority allowing Parliament's business to be conducted, but it might easily be mistaken for a medieval weapon. So the formalities are very different tonight, but notwithstanding that, we are ever mindful that we are on hallowed ground the House of Parliament, the People's House. Tonight, we are in for a definite treat, as on this occasion of the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Parliament building, we will reflect on the steady, visible development of our elective branch of government. Within this hollow chamber, we gather both as members of Parliament and engaged citizens to listen to two scholarly presentations on the separation of powers and to engage in discourse about what this means to all of us. 
To ensure we can all enjoy tonight's event, I would like to remind you of certain housekeeping matters. Firstly, let's turn off our phones or put them on mute. That is, I'm sure, one nuisance that the participants who gathered in this forum 50 years ago did not have to contend with. <laughs> on the brighter side of technology, this afternoon's lecture is being broadcasted live via YouTube for wider audiences to enjoy. So immediately following this portion of the evening, we will exit the chamber and take our seats in the great outdoors where we will enjoy a wide variety of cultural performances. With those brief comments, it is my pleasure to invite tonight's host, the speaker, Honorable Dr. W. Makiva Bush, who has been the driving force behind the creation of this new Parliament Lecture Series, as ably assisted by the capable clerk and staff of the Parliament. The Honorable Speaker will now offer tonight's official welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, although protocols have been established, I do specially welcome and recognize former speakers, Dr. Pearson and Mrs. Lawrence, and to recognize former members of the House, and I do want to acknowledge, I believe, the most Senior members of the bar, Mr. Raymond Alberger, and I hope other senior members are here. And to say good afternoon and welcome to all of you. I am certainly most honored and privileged to extend a very special welcome to you on this auspicious and historic occasion of the 50th anniversary of the House of Parliament. This is a landmark achievement. Right off at straight, I'd like to say that I was here, not as a member, but as a as curious onlooker at the opening of the building, and as one of the members of the public in the gallery when this building was first opened and used. I should say also that I am old enough, and one of the pictures, I am somewhere about there, as a young Cub Scout when this site was the Park, Princess Royal Park. I was a Cub Scout when it hosted the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband. So I am that old. <laughs> I am most honored and welcome all of you. We have gathered here to celebrate and witness a momentous event. After the first cornerstone was laid, the building was given and handed over on July 22, 1972. A number of Caymanian tradesmen and artisans have constructed this building, and it has undergone significant renovations in early 2000, and most certainly after Hurricane Ivan in 2004. And as strong as we look, as the building looked, I should say, we are still renovating. We are still trying to fix some of the problems that were here when I came in here in 1984 in November. I have envisioned this parliament to be not only a world class or first class, but certainly one of its kind that is worthy of emulation with a new strategic direction and a paradigm shift. To that end, as Speaker of this Parliament, I have engendered the functions of the Parliament to not only ascribe to the usual nomenclature for 
legislative purposes and primarily known for making and amending laws, now acts, or scrutinizing and holding government accountable. But I will also promote the parliament to be an institution of ideas and the generation of thoughts in relation to topical issues and matters of current affairs of national, regional, and international importance. And that, of course, I cannot do as a speaker in the House, but as the speaker in the country, I certainly take that importance to do that. And there are many such issues. We will certainly, at times, rely on foreign people, experts in their discipline, but also our locals in their field of speciality and expertise for these lectures, series. The multiplicity of functions will be inclusive of the generating of ideas and intellectual debates and lectures which will assist us in informed decision-making processes in the country. At least that's what I hope. I hope it don't turn into a political fight at any time. That's not what it's all about. It's time that we do raise about that. And that's what I am trying to engender. The Cayman Islands Constitution Order 2009 entrenched the legislature as one of the fundamental pillars of government by virtue of that constitution, part of that constitution. This is the first educational and eminent lecture, which is set on separation of powers from parliament, and the next will be, I hope, the balance between environment and sustainable development. This step is undoubtedly a part of our political maturation process as we evolve and transition into a more democratic society, and also recognizing the three co-equal branches or arms of government, which as we know are the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Our constitution is a living document which enshrines the doctrine of separation of powers, which promotes democracy and institutional good governance. Interestingly, the parliament is, parliament is now autonomous and ought to e equally enjoy its freedoms and liberties as the other co-equal branches of government. And I should add, Mr. Premier, with our relevant budget. We are mindful that no arm of government should overreach or exceed their authority by imposing onto the other arms of the state. As a result, we consider this lecture in furtherance of the separation of powers by an eminent constitutional scholar to be very timely and will provide context and perspective. Our guest speaker, Dr. Barnett, has a long and distinguished career at the bar as a practicing attorney at law and is renowned throughout the region and had conduct of complex constitutional matters on separation of powers and appeared at all levels across the tiers of government, the courts, and the Privy Council. Therefore, I welcome you all for the 50th anniversary of the House of Parliament and the first of the lecture series. I am appreciative that young Mr. Barton whom I have known from, he was a little boy. I'm that old, I'm that old Barton. <laughs> I'm that old, Richard. But I'm very appreciative that he's consented to do a presentation on the local perspective on the separation of powers. As I said, also is the highly esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Barnett, where we anticipate there will be learning and stimulation of thoughts and ideas. I'm obligated to disclose that we were able to engage Dr. Barnett without him charging for this special lecture. Just to mention, he's a most staunch advocate for educating the general public, and that's what we seek to do here. 
We are fortunate to have a man of his caliber and prominence addressing us. I will end on the note that it's my goal and intention to make this noble institution effective, efficient, and a high-performing parliament with the support of, of, of the council from the commission and the dedicated members and staff here. I say welcome to you all, and I know that you will enjoy this evening's program. Let me say too, I do hope that most of you will be able to come to the outside where there's a where school children and others have put on a show to commemorate this evening, today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your reflections and for your warm welcome. Your passion for promoting the development of parliamentary democracy is clearly evident. Your vision, as ever, is bold. And you've really set the stage quite nicely for what is to come with the lecture series. Thank you, sir. As with every gathering in this hallowed institution, we open tonight with prayer. I invite the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Roy McTaggart, to offer the prayer. Please stand. Thank you, Madam Master of Ceremonies. Good afternoon, colleagues, friends, family, all gathered this evening. Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, how holy, righteous is your name. We beseech you, this fa Father, this afternoon to grace us with your presence. We invite you, Father, in this assembly, as we gather this evening to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the opening of this parliament and to receive the first of this series of lectures. Father, we are grateful for opportunities like this, and we are especially grateful and thankful for the two distinguished guests we have today who will be leading us in these lectures and give us more information and understanding with regard to the separation of powers. Give us all wisdom, give us all knowledge, give us understanding. And Father, please bless our speakers today as they seek to impart their understanding and their knowledge and give us the opportunity to hear and to assimilate and to put into practice the things that we should learn today. Would you bless all that we say and do here this evening, but especially we pray your blessings upon our speakers. Give us grace and give us understanding and bless these proceedings this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart, for your warm and moving prayer. As we have been blessed tonight with not one, but two highly accomplished persons who will present on the evening's topic, the separation of powers, I invite Parliamentary Secretary, Ms. Heather Bodden, to present our first presenter, Mr. Richard Barton, who, following the introduction, will provide the local perspective. We request that you hold any questions or comments you may have for Mr. Barton, until both speakers have delivered their presentations. Ms. Bodden, if you would. Thank you, Acting Deputy Governor, Honorable Gloria McPhail. I offer apologies for MP Isaac Rankin. Mr. Richard Barton, Attorney at Law. Mr. Richard Barton is married to Caroline Barton and father to their two girls, Monroe, eight, and Mercy, four. He's the eldest of three children to Anne-Marie Barton and Richard Barton, Sr., and has a deep family and community roots within the islands. Richard is Jamaican by birth, but has spent most of his life in the Cayman Islands. Throughout the years, he's maintained close relationships with friends and family in these two jurisdictions, which he regards as his twin homes. 
Richard is the founder and managing, direct, managing partner of Barton Attorneys. After receiving dual academic scholarships from the Cayman Islands government and walkers, he was admitted to practice as an attorney in the Cayman Islands in 2006. Prior to his admission in the Cayman Islands, Richard was admitted as a barrister in England and Wales in 2005, non-practicing. Richard is also a member of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn, London. Prior to establishing his own forum, Richard worked in a leading global offshore law firm as an associate where he practiced dispute resolution, general commercial law, and insolvency. He was previously Crown Counsel in the Office of the Honorable Attorney General's Chambers. Richard is a two-term incumbent council member of the Cayman Islands Legal Practitioners Association and is primarily responsible for firms with 10 attorneys or less, as well as leading the CILPA Education Subcommittee. He also sits as a member of the Legal Advisory Council, along with, amongst others, the Honorable Attorney General and Honorable Chief Justice. Additionally, Richard is the current chairperson of the Planning Appeals Tribunal, Deputy Chair of the Health Appeals Tribunal, Member of Police Service Commission, chaired by His Excellency the Governor, Member of the Ethics Committee of Health City, Cayman Islands, and a member of the CUC Cayman Islands Youth Football League Board of Directors. Richard was, also, Richard was also the previous chair of the Cayman Islands Football Association Disciplinary Committee. I welcome Mr. Barton. Protocol being established. Good afternoon, everyone. James Madison, the fourth president of the United States, said as follows, quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether in one, a few, or many, whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elected, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Although there is no explicit reference to the separation of powers in Cayman, the doctrine is formalized by way of statutory instrument in the form of the Cayman Islands Constitution Order 2009. Amendments to the Constitution in 2020 further crystallized the position by the creation of Parliament. This came on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the former Legislative Assembly built in 1972. The Honorable Dr. Lloyd Barnett, Order of Jamaica, will speak on the separation of powers predominantly in simple terms, and as noted by Professor Ian Loveland, the separation of powers doctrine is the division of government functions into three discrete categories. Parts three, four, and five of our constitution establish the formation of the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary respectively. The executive is a function of government tasked with the execution of laws. The legislature, known as parliament, makes these laws, which are interpreted by the judiciary, the third branch 
of government. In the Cayman Islands, the executive authority rests with Her Majesty the Queen. This authority is exercised on her behalf by the government, which consists of His Excellency the Governor as Her Majesty's representative and cabinet. The cabinet consists of the governor, the premier, and previously six ministers until an amendment in 2020 that increased this number to seven. Other members include the deputy governor and the honorable attorney general who are deemed ex officio members. Whereas prior to 2020, the constitution stated that the number of ministers were not to exceed two-fifths of the total elected members of the former Legislative Assembly. Following amendments, the Constitution now requires two-fifths plus one. Further amendments and a key significant development in our political maturity now vests Cabinet with exclusive autonomous responsibility for domestic affairs. External affairs, defense, and internal security, including the police, are deemed special responsibilities reserved for His Excellency, the Governor. Other material changes in relation to the executive include a change in the circumstances by which the Governor is required to consult Cabinet, the creation of parliamentary secretaries, and the creation of a police service commission. As already noted, the Constitution creates a legislature which shall consist of Her Majesty and Parliament. Part four of the Constitution states that the legislature is assigned the responsibility to make laws for peace, order, and good governance of the Cayman Islands. Parliament, formerly the Legislative Assembly, consists of the Honorable Speaker, who presides over the House proceedings, 19 elected members, now referred to as MPs, the Deputy Governor, and the Attorney General. A leader of opposition must also be appointed by the Governor. Any member of Parliament may introduce or present a bill for debate. Before a bill is passed into law, it must first receive assent from the governor on behalf of Her Majesty, or Her Majesty assents through a Secretary of State. Another key development in the recent abolition of the power of Her Majesty to disallow any laws previously assented to by the governor through a Secretary of State is noteworthy. The Cayman Islands Constitution order that was amended in 2020 repealed Section 80 and instead introduced pre-legislative protocols in this regard. The third and final branch of government is the judiciary, as already noted, and exists in Part 5 of the Constitution. The judiciary comprises of the Grand Court, which is the superior court of record, Court of Appeal, also a superior court of record, to which appeals from the Grand Court are considered. The Constitution also provides for the creation of subordinate courts over which the Grand Court shall have jurisdiction. In this case, and in the Cayman Islands, the summary court of the Cayman Islands adjudicates on less serious matters that are subject to appeal in the higher courts. The Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary and is responsible for the management of all matters arising in the courts. And in 2016, by way of the Cayman Islands Constitution Amendment Order 2016, the retirement age for judges was increased from age 65 to age 70. Although limited in scope to interpret laws, the court may on occasion influence lawmaking through what is known as common law. 
This is often the case where legislation is either absent or ambiguous, and decisions made in the court of superior jurisdiction shapes the law, albeit informally. In conclusion, the Cayman Islands have come a very far away democratically since 1959, when the first constitution took effect. Successive generations have continued to build upon the fundamental belief in this concept of governance. Notable constitutional changes over the decades range from the replacement of the governor as president of the former assembly by the Honorable Speaker in 1972. The change from EXCO to cabinet in 2003, the introduction of a premier and leader of opposition in 2009, and of course, the creation of parliament in 2020. The net effect of this evolution is that today, the Cayman Islands can proudly boast a system of governance in which the concept of separation of powers is steeply entrenched. It will be left for generations that follow to safeguard against the consolidation of power to ensure always that necessary checks and balances remain. Before I take my leave this afternoon, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the Honorable Speaker for the invitation to participate in this momentous occasion. It is truly an honor and a privilege. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Mr. Garfield Ellison, the Chief Parliamentary Advisor. Without his invaluable input and generous assistance, this presentation would simply not be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very much, Mr. Barton, for your presentation. You've provided a very thorough overview of the various branches of government and the way that they function, how they've matured, and the very critical um, importance of our being able to preserve the separation of power. I, I note your observations about guarding against the consolidation of power. And you know what they say about power, so I it, thank you very much for those insights, sir. Well, the evening is continuing, and we are up for another thought-provoking presentation. We have the pleasure next of hearing from a renowned expert, this time in the area of constitutional law, who will share further insights this evening. To introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. the Honorable Lloyd Barnett, I invite the Deputy Premier who, as you know, is himself an avid reader, someone who is very interested in history, politics, and indeed parliamentary democracy. So without further ado, I invite Deputy Premier Honorable Christopher Saunders to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Saunders. Thank you, Madam Master of Ceremonies. Colleagues, I have the pleasure this afternoon to introduce the guest speaker, Dr. Lloyd Barnett. For those in attendance and those listening via the media that do not have a copy of the program, I will read Dr. Barnett's bio that is presented in today's program. Dr. Barnett has a long and distinguished career at the bar as a practicing attorney at law in the course of which he has served the profession in many capacities. After 10 years in the public service at the Attorney General Chambers and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, Dr. Barnett has carried on a private practice. He has appeared in the Superior Courts of Jamaica and several Caribbean countries, as well as the Privy Council and the Caribbean Court of Justice. He was a founding member of the Jamaican Bar Association 
serving as his president on two separate occasions. He has served as the president of the, Org of the Organization of Commonwealth Caribbean Bar Association, chairman of the General Legal Council, the Jamaican Council for Human Rights, the University Council of Jamaica, the Caribbean Council of Legal Education, and Chairman for Citizen Action for Free and Fair Elections. In 2006, the Caribbean Council of Legal Education launched an annual Dr. Lloyd Barnett lecture series in his honor. He served as a member of the Public Police Services Commission in Jamaica. He has been a civil society leader, human rights advocate, and former senator in the Parliament of Jamaica. Dr. Barnett was a member of the Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission at its inception and deputy chairman from 2012 to 2016. He's the author of two books on Jamaica's constitution and numerous articles on a variety of legal subjects, which have earned him the respect of judicial and academic authorities. In 1999, Dr. Barnett was awarded Jamaica National Honor, the Order of Jamaica, for his outstanding contribution in the field of jurisprudence in the region. Apart from obtaining his Master's of Law degree in, and PhD in London, both the University of Technology and the University of West Indies have conferred the Honor Doctorate in Law, LLD, on Dr. Barnett. Colleagues, now that I have gotten what is in the program out of the way? What I'm about to say is not in the program. When Speaker Bush first asked me to introduce Dr. Barnett, I said yes without thinking. I've learned over the years that Speaker Bush has fine tuned the process of getting people to say yes sometimes without them realizing. He will call you when he knows you're in the middle of something or late at night and you want to sleep, and at that time you tell him yes, just to get him off the phone. This is actually one time I'm actually happy I said yes. I actually took the time out to do my own research on Dr. Barnett, as I was curious as to how someone so distinguished and qualified did not show up on my radar earlier. The first thing that jumped out of me is that in none of the articles where he's mentioned is a picture where he's smiling. I said to myself, this gentleman is always serious. And then it occurred to me why. Dr. Barnett was born in a time when the rights of our people were constantly being trampled on and there was a need for lawyers. There was a need for people to fight and represent those of us that needed representation. That was a time when the exploitation of our people and natural resources were at an all-time high, and her best and brightest minds were needed. Dr. Barnett was one of those that answered the call. He stood up then and continues to do so today. So he's not afraid to challenge the government of the day anywhere, regardless of his personal friendships and political affiliation, and that, and that says something about him. Public patriotism is more important than political patronage. The reason why I say public patriotism is, is, um, is important, the reason why I say public patriotism is it is that important in our democratic system that our friends and our supporters not only hold us accountable privately as politicians, but also publicly. Our democratic system recognizes that there will be differences and disagreements and it requires us to have debate and discussion to find consensus. For too long in our political system, we are focused on the individuals and not their ideas and their personalities and not their policies. Dr. Barnett has advocated and continues to advocate for those principles that ensure democracy remains alive and achieve its primary purpose of freedom and equality. As a result of his long and distinguished track record, today he is recognized as one, of the Jama uh, one of, as one of Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the Commonwealth most eminent constitutional expert. Another reason I am happy to have said yes is that he's also a graduate of Calabar High School. <laughs> 
which is also my alma mater. So as a fellow member of the tribe of Rabalat, which is actually Calabar spelled backwards, it pleases me to see Dr. Barnett as a chief and continues to achieve our school motto, the utmost for the highest. I um, just want to leave my prepared remarks a little bit. And on a personal note, thank the speaker and for all those who are gathered here today for this um, discussion on the separation of powers. Um, many people would recognize that the United States, I think back in 246 years ago, when they started their democracy, which was one of the first in the Western Hemisphere, at that time, we are talking about replacing the monarch system. And you literally had nowhere to start. But they actually started with guidance from the Bible in terms of using Isaiah 33, 22, which says, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he shall save us. It is, from those, it is from that line in the Bible where you got the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. And I really, really welcome this discussion here today because at the end of the day, regardless of what people may think about democracy, it is still the youngest form of government that we have because the one that it actually replaced has been there for thousands of years before. And so this is timely and welcome. Dr. Barnett, I want to personally, on behalf of my colleagues, all the members of parliament in this honorable house, and all those listening, welcome you to the Cayman Islands and look forward to your contributions here today. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Acting Governor, Honorable Premier, Honorable Justice Williams, representing the Chief Justice, and I have now mentioned persons representative of the three arms of government that we will be discussing. I want to thank the Deputy Premier for the words of introduction, and in particular for the restraint with which he did it, because I know he went back to consult with the Honorable Percival Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, who attended Calabar at the same time with me. <laughs> and he has not disclosed any of the things which the Honorable Prime Minister might have told him. I am very grateful to the Honourable Speaker for having contacted me and uh, invited me to participate in this historic ceremony. I will adopt the protocol which has been established, but you'll forgive me if I make special mention of Mr. Raymond Alberger, Queen's Council who was instrumental in the commencement of my private practice. And we worked together in the establishment of the uh, modern Jamaican Bar Association. I'm grateful to my colleague, who is remarkably a member of Lincoln's Inn, that glorious inn which I share with him, and for his exposition on the Cayman experience, which I will also mention in my presentation, but in the context of the comparative constitutionalism of the Commonwealth on the subject of the separation of powers. 
government powers are wide, varied, and impactive. Their main features are, as you have heard, legislative, executive, and judicial. It has long been feared that the concentration of all these three functions of government in one person or group of persons is dangerous to democracy, the rule of law, and personal freedom. The principle that these powers should be separated is traceable way back to the Middle Ages to Aristotle and Locke, but it is in the somewhat erroneous analysis by Montesquieu of the English constitutional system in the 18th century that the doctrine gained currency. A cursory examination of modern Commonwealth Caribbean constitution demonstrates the architectural design which is a structure consisting of three towers, executive, legislative, judiciary. However, they are interlinking archways, common corridors, and interconnected conduits. Accordingly, the true position is that the main constitutional systems do not have a strict or absolute separation of powers. In the presidential system, which the United States of America is a prominent example, there is structural as well as functional separation. There, the president is appointed on the basis of a separate election, is not a member of the legislature, and his cabinet does not consist of any members of the legislature. Even there, however, there are modifications on the separation of powers doctrine, as for example, by the president's power to legislate through executive orders, the power to appoint Supreme Court and appellate judges, and the requirement for a signature to legislation. In the parliamentary system, which is typical of many Commonwealth constitutions, there is a significant link between the legislative and executive organs in that the prime minister or chief minister is elected in the general parliamentary elections and is appointed on the basis of his support by a majority of the members of the national legislature. The cabinet over which he presides is also selected from members of the elected legislature. In both systems, however, it would be true to say that there's relatively strict separation of the judicial power so that members of the executive or legislature do not hold judicial posts or exercise judicial power, and the judiciary is not part of the legislature or executive. It is now generally accepted that absolute separation is neither desirable nor practical. The modern approach is therefore to modify the separation of powers while at the same time to implement efficient safeguards against abuse. This more flexible approach is reflected in most modern Commonwealth constitutions where there's basic structural separation of powers with modifications which limit the dangers of inefficiency which come from rigidity but nevertheless maintain safeguards by means of mechanisms of accountability. This objective has largely been achieved by the more expansive distribution of responsibilities, which may be more appropriately have been the title of this presentation, but I did not have the honorable speaker's permission. In dealing with the doctrine of the separation of powers, I will therefore focus some attention on the distribution of responsibilities. But let us look first at the structure of the separation. In accordance with the architectural design which I referred to, in most modern Commonwealth constitutions, of which the Constitution of the Cayman Islands is an example, there are separate parts or chapters of the Constitution dealing with the three main functions of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. 
Thus, in the Cayman Constitution, there are parts dealing with the executive comprising the governor, the cabinet, ministers of government, attorneys general, director of public prosecutions, and the National Security Council. Secondly, there are separate parts dealing with the legislative branch comprising the parliament, the speaker, deputy speaker, and leader of the opposition. Thirdly, there are separate parts dealing with the judiciary, the chief justice, judges of the high court, and court of appeal. As a colony, the executive power of the Cayman Islands is vested in Her Majesty. For practical purposes, this formulation is not very different from that of independent Commonwealth countries, such as Antigua and Barbuda and Jamaica, which retain the Queen as head of state. And the executive authority is stated to be vested in Her Majesty and is to be executed on her behalf by the Governor General, either directly or through officers subordinate to him. But in law as well as in practice, the real policymaking body is the Cabinet. The position is essentially the same in Dominican, Trinidad and Tobago, which have a Republican form of government, where the executive authority is formally vested in the President. Under these constitutions, he or she is also required to act on the advice of the Cabinet. In the parliamentary Cabinet system, the essential factor is that the Cabinet is responsible to Parliament for the policy it creates, any advice given to the Governor General or President, and for all things done by or under the authority of any minister in the execution of his office. The Prime Minister or Premier, who is the political head of the executive, is appointed on the basis of his having the support of the majority of elected members of the majority party in the legislature. As we have noted, this major departure from the separation of the executive and the legislative power is a characteristic of the parliamentary system of government. In these constitutions, the legislative power is vested in a parliament which consists of elected members. The constitutions define this power as making laws for the peace, order, and good government of the country. It has been held by long-standing authority that these words in Commonwealth constitutional language connote the widest lawmaking powers appropriate to a sovereign. The third name, the judicial power is vested in the judiciary. The Commonwealth pattern for superior courts is followed by separate provisions in Part 5 of the Cayman Constitution for the establishment of the judicature. Accordingly, the Grand Court is established as a superior court with the jurisdiction conferred on it by the Constitution and any other law. Similarly, a court of appeal is established with the jurisdiction to hear and determine such appeals from the, gun court, from the Grand Court, as may be prescribed by the Constitution or any other law. So let us now look at the interconnection of the executive and legislative organs, which is a critical feature of the parliamentary cabinet system. The interconnection, which we have described as existing between the executive and the legislative organs of government in the Cayman Islands Constitution is typical of the situation in countries with the parliamentary system within or without the Commonwealth. It is often forgotten that the parliament cabinet system, which sometimes is described as the Westminster model, exists in several other countries outside of the Commonwealth. The symbiosis is not dependent merely on the commonality of person in that the Cabinet or Executive Council is primarily made up of elected members of the legislature, but on the status of leadership with the elected members of the legislature who constitute the Cabinet or Executive Council occupy. Within the sphere of authority of the Executive is the formulation of the policies which inform the activities and the programs of the legislature. The budget, Legislative programs and the formulation of projects are directed by the policy decisions of the executive. Accordingly, 
In place of separation, there is interconnectivity of powers and functions. The extent of this interconnection is demonstrated by the prevailing practice of the widespread utilization of delegated legislation. The complexities of modern state organization are such that it is often impractical to incorporate all detailed measures in the Acts of Parliament, and so authority to make subsidiary legislation is often vested in the executive. As a result, the volume of legislation made by the executive often far exceeds that made by the legislature. Even where such delegated legislation is subject to the affirmative or negative resolution of the legislature, the control or supervision is in practice very limited and in any event is led by the executive. Governmental policy and modern legislating drafting techniques tend to confer on ministers and executive officers wide discretion to make regulations and in effect, therefore, to modify to a substantial extent the separation of the legislative power. I will deal specifically with the separation of the judicial power. The most significant adherence to the doctrine of the separation of powers is in respect of the judicial power. Constitutions do not, as a general practice, define the judicial power. An Irish judge stated, from none of the pronouncements as to the nature of the judicial power, which have been quoted, can be a definition at once exhaustive and precise be extracted. And probably, no such definition can be framed. The varieties and combinations of powers with which the legislature may equip a tribunal are infinite. And in each case, the particular powers must be considered in their totality and separately to see if a tribunal so endowed and is invested with powers of such a nature and extent that their exercise is in effect administering that justice which appertains to the judicial organ and which the Constitution indicates is properly entrusted only to judges. Commonwealth constitutions typically provide a special mechanism for the appointment and tenure of office of judges and for their independence in the exercise of their judicial functions. The essence of this separatedness is the absence of control in respect of the adjudication of particular cases. However, the separatedness is not absolute in the sense that the legislature within its constitutional competence determines the content of the law and may alter or revoke, although, although not always retrospectively, existing law, whether customary or legislative. The judiciary has to interpret and enforce the law as formulated by the legislature in the case of the parent statute and by the executive in the case of delegated legislation unless questions as to their constitutional validity arise. Commonwealth constitutions express the doctrine of separation of the judicial power, not only by the establishment of an independent and impartial judiciary, but also by the protection of his jurisdiction and powers from intervention or control by the legislature or the executive. Thus, the rights and obligations of litigants are determined by the exercise of the judicial power without any intervention by the, by the executive or the legislature, which are bound to respect and conform with the decisions of the judges. The separatedness of the judicial power is assumed by the constitutions, which both expressly and by clear implication confine the judicial power to the judiciary. The high point of this separation is the authority of judges to interpret the Constitution itself so that the very validity of executive and legislative action is determined by the judiciary. This is essential to the separation of the judicial power, since otherwise the legislature and executive would be unable 
to disregard or control the constituted judiciary. Where constitutional issues arise, it is clear that their determination is in the providence or in the province of the judiciary. Similarly, where the determination of guilt or the imposition of penalties after determination of guilt is involved, a trial by a judicial officer is constitutionally required. And next, turn to the allocation of responsibilities, which, as I say, is a feature which impacts on the doctrine of separation of powers. As already stated, this basic structural separation of powers is qualified or enhanced by ancillary provisions which enable governments to operate efficiently while preventing the abuse of power. There are many examples in relation to the executive power where the Constitution provides checks and balances. Thus, in Cayman, the governor is required to consult with the cabinet in the exercise of his functions, unless it is not reasonably practical to do so, or it is a function which is to be exercised in a sole discretion. In exercising the powers of pardon, the governor is required to consult with the advisory committee on the prerogative of mercy. Usually, the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions, which is an important executive officer, is a public office which is not appointed or controlled by the political executive. The holder of this office has the important executive function of instituting, taking over, and conducting criminal prosecutions. Even where this function is exercised by an attorney general who is a member of the political executive, there are usually conventions that he should exercise those powers free of political control or direction. This is a clear demonstration on how, with respect to one of the three branches of government, safeguards against abuse may be instituted by the isolation and allocation of responsibilities within that arm of the government. In relation to the legislature, any question as to whether a person has been validly elected or has vacated his or her seat is duly entrusted to the courts for determination. In the Cayman, there is an exceptional variation in that the legislative function is democratized by a special provision which allows for people initiated referenda on the basis of 25% support of the electorate on a matter of national importance. Accordingly, this provision qualifies the separatedness of the legislature by modifying its exclusive right to initiate legislation. An important responsibility of the legislative organ, which is now commonly assigned to a non-legislative independent body, is the delineation of constituencies. Thus, as in many Commonwealth countries, Cayman has an electoral boundary commission, which is independent of the elected legislation. By the allocation of this responsibility to a non-political partisan body, the dangers of political gerrymandering of constituencies are minimized or eliminated. Commonwealth constitutions also usually contain clear provisions for the constitution of the judiciary, the composition of the courts, the appointment, remuneration, and removal of judges. The recurring feature of these arrangements is the establishment of a judicial and legal service commi services commission, which makes judicial appointments and has the power to remove and exercise disciplinary control over persons holding judicial offices. The executive and legislative branches are thus excluded from controlling the judicial branch. While public officers or civil servants are part of the executive, it is a tendency in Commonwealth constitutions that public officers in central government are appointed by commissions which are independent of the political executive. It is the duty of public officers to implement government policy and to carry out the directions of the cabinet or political executive. An important executive office which is not controlled by the political executive is the Auditor General, who has the responsibility to audit the accounts 
and financial dealings of government departments and authorities. Audit the generals are usually answerable to public accounts committees of the elected legislature and attend the meetings of its public accounts committee, but is not governed or controlled by the legislature or other members of the executive. The trend in many modern democratic systems is to provide for the exercise of important powers to be monitored by independent or specialist bodies, such as an ombudsman or public defender. In the Cayman Constitution, there is a special part on institutions supporting democracy. There is under these provisions a human rights commission with the primary responsibility of promoting and protecting human rights. There is also a novel commission for standards in public life with the objective of assisting in setting the high standards of integrity and competence in public life and to monitor standards of ethical conduct. There is also a complaints commissioner or ombudsman to examine complaints and monitor abuses of human rights. It should also be observed that the modern trend is for the allocation of responsibilities to independent commissions, boards, and authorities which exercise monitoring functions in relation to the actions of legislators and members of the executive in relation to the award of contracts, financial contribution to political parties, and the conduct of political campaigns. The execution of these monitoring mechanisms has become more important as governmental activities expand and diversify, and new boards and authorities exercise licensing powers, conduct controlling roles, and perform public function. Now, these basic principles of separation and allocation of responsibilities have been the subject of considerable litigation over the last 50 years. I've, in preparing these papers, looked at over 50 cases from 20 different countries. I won't deal with all of them <laughs> now, but it's an indication to you how important this topic is. So let me deal first with some cases on the judicial application of the doctrine in relation to the executive power. In, the, in a case in India, the Supreme Court of India reversed the High Court direction, requiring a state government to file an affidavit setting out what action is being taken by it to implement the recommendation of an anti-ragging committee and held that the matter was entirely outside of the jurisdiction of the court, as it was for the executive and not the judicial branch of the government to decide whether or not to introduce the recommended legislation. In a, another case, in Trinidad and Tobago, the respondent was a company manufacturing confectionery and it applied to the minister to have the importation of confectionery restricted. So it was a question of trade control. The Court of Appeals stated that the Constitution being based on the Westminster model provides for the separation of powers, and the Court should be careful not to usurp the functions conferred on another organ of the state. The relevant power to decide whether goods should be negative listed was a matter within the powers of the executive acting through the minister, and the matter was entirely within the minister's discretion. In a Virgin Islands case, there have been media statements alleging payment of bribes to a minister in the Virgin Islands. The chief minister appointed a commission of inquiry to investigate the matter, and on the basis of his report, advised the governor to rescind the minister's appointment. The Court of Appeal held that the Chief Minister in exercising his constitutional power
in the matter of Eurobank Corporation, the Chief Justice Smelly in 2001 in the Cayman Grand Court held that a provision of the Companies Act requiring the courts leave to institute criminal proceedings did not offend against the Attorney General's constitutional power to institute and undertake criminal proceedings free of the direction or control of other persons or authorities. The purpose of Section 16A of the Constitution was to ensure his independence from political or the extraneous intervention in the exercise of the right to prosecute. It did not govern the court's intervention in the exercise of its inherent jurisdiction or statutory powers to control its own process. In a very interesting case in 2003, the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka examined a bill proposing the transfer of the executive power to advise the dissolution of parliament from the executive head of the government to the parliament itself. The court stated, the constitution which was based on the rule of law provided the powers of government were included in the sovereignty of the people as proclaimed in the constitution. Those powers were separated and attributed to the three organs of government the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, which exercise powers in trust for the people. The transfer of a power attributed by the Constitution to one organ of government to another, or the relinquishment or removal of such power would be an alienation of sovereignty inconsistent with the Constitution. In another Cayman case, Bolton, the uh, appellant had been cited by the Cayman Grand Court for contempt of court. Although it disclaimed having reached any factual conclusions, the court decided that the appellant ought to be cited for contempt of court and directed the attorney general to commence further proceeding against him. The court also decided that no further action was to be taken against the other parties. The Court of Appeal held that the Grand Court's decision at the conclusion of the initial proceedings, that the appellant should be cited for contempt in fresh proceedings, and that the Attorney General should be directed to institute those proceedings, was final and determinated of those proceedings. As the court did not find that the appellant had been guilty of contempt, he was, according, he was accordingly entitled to be acquitted, and the Grand Court had therefore erred in deciding that there should be further proceedings against it for the same alleged contempt. Furthermore, it was for the Attorney General, in his absolute discretion, to determine in the public interest whether or not to prosecute, and he could not be given directions in this respect by the Grand Court. No further proceedings should be taken against the appellant in connection with this matter, and the Grand Court decision in its initial proceedings was set aside. I will now deal with the cases on the legislature. The separate characteristics of the legislature were demonstrated in the case of Astafan and the Control of Customs, where the Customs Control and Management Act of Dominico empowered a customs officer to impose an estimated duty, as well as a further sum on imported goods where perfect entry had not been made by the importer. The Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal held that the principle of separation of powers was implicit in the Constitution and any law inconsistent with that principle was unconstitutional and invalid. The power to impose taxes and duties was inherently a legislative power, constitutionally vested in the legislature. Therefore, if the further sum authorized the property officer to demand was a tax or duty, the legislature delegated 
or transferred its legislative power of taxation to the executive, which practice was not necessarily inconsistent with the principle of separation of powers, provided that the legislature retained effective control over the executive in the latter's exercise of the delegated or transferred power by circumscribing the power or by prescribing guidelines or a policy for the exercise of the power. And so that uh, discretion granted to the taxing officer was held to be unconstitutional. Basic principle in Commonwealth constitutional law that the legislature has the sole right to control its own procedure and internal proceeding. This has been the subject of litigation in several cases. For example, in Sanfit, the Supreme Court of Tonga held that the court had no jurisdiction to pronounce on the internal proceedings of the assembly, which including the procedure adopted by it to conduct its business. Thus, a conflict about such matters as to which member had not been allowed to speak in debates or whether the journal contained a full record of the proceedings were part of the legislative process, and it was not the function of the court to become involved. In Detonamo, the petitioner was the acting president of Noro, who, with the approval of the cabinet, referred for the opinion of the court the question of which withdrawal of monies from the Treasury into which monies for the trust was paid required a recommendation to Parliament from the Cabinet. The Constitution provided for such a reference to the Court for an advisory opinion. Chief Justice Dunn said that the Court was confined to the interpretation role conferred by the Constitution and could not express an opinion on the merits or the merits of the bill or act as a forum for the airing of a political argument. Further, the decision to grant the certificate was entirely the prerogative of the Speaker, and under the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament, its proceedings are not matters which could be the subject or question or direction of the court. There's a very instructive case in Mauritius where a member of Parliament applied to the Speaker for leave of absence, having already been absent for a substantial period and did not obtain the extension he applied for. But the Prime Minister requested the hasty recall of Parliament for sitting at an unusually early hour, knowing that he would be unable to reach the Parliament. The Attorney General's application for determination that his seat had been vacated was dismissed. The Supreme Court held on appeal where Parliament exercised sovereign powers under the Constitution, and the Court was empowered to exercise a particular jurisdiction, which itself required an inquiry into the exercise of such parliamentary powers. <coughs> then the Court's jurisdiction had to be exercised to the extent necessary to enable it to determine the particular question before it. In these circumstances, it would be wrong to invoke the sovereignty of Parliament to prevent scrutiny by the court and paralyze the effective exercise of the court's constitutional jurisdiction. In this regard, terms such as sovereignty and supremacy were relative and not absolute. The Constitution contained entrenched provisions which conferred on the jurisdiction the overall control of the constitutionality of acts by the legislature or executive. And further, although it was for the Speaker to decide whether Parliament should be recalled, it was for the Court to decide whether Parliament had been recalled in circumstances which were constitutionally valid. The courts had evolved the doctrine of colorable legislation to impugn an enactment which was prima facie valid, and an analogous, an analogous approach applied to the, to the exercise of constitutional and statutory powers. The right of a member of parliament to seat was a constitutional one and could only be removed in accordance 
with strict limits provided by the Constitution in the case of disqualification to absence. The recall of Parliament on that date for sitting at 9 a.m. the next morning was at such no short notice that the claim that such a call was in the public interest was so contrived that the only result which was achieved was the bring about of a situation which would automatically cause the respondent to be disqualified. The device use was so colorable and unreasonable in view of the short notice given that it did not count for the purpose of computing the length of the respondent's absence from Parliament. I'm going to deal next with a case from Guyana in the Attorney General and Trotman. The Court of Appeal examined the relationship between the executive and the legislature in relation to the important subject of public expenditure and held that on a proper construction of the usual constitutional provisions it was for the finance minister on behalf of the executive to present estimates of revenues and expenditure for the approval of the legislature. However, the court held that it would defeat logic and common sense to contend that the National Assembly could disapprove of the entire estimates of expenditure, but did not have the implied power to adopt a less drastic measure to reduce the estimates to a lesser sum. Such a power was essential in the determination by the National Assembly whether it should give its approval to the estimates of expenditure presented. The National Assembly was not expected to automatically and mechanically approve of the estimates of expenditure presented by the minister. There was a rational connection between the need for approval of the estimates and the reduction of those estimates by the Assembly before approval of a reduced sum. The National Assembly, therefore, had the constitutional authority to amend the estimates of expenditure presented before it by the minister. Okay. In respect now of the third organ, the judiciary, I will start with a Cayman case. In re Cayman Islands Public Service, the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, which then exercised jurisdiction in Cayman Appeals, held that it was wrong in principle for a judge who was both a member of the Executive Council and the Legislative Assembly to hear a case to which the government was an interested party, especially when it stood to gain considerably if judgment were given in its favor. Moreover, even without any actual involvement by him, in a particular matter before the Executive Council, his subsequent function as a judge in relation to it would call into question the strict impartiality which should be the hallmark of the administration of justice. In the famous case of bribery commissioners and Ranasi from then Ceylon, the Privy Council examined Ordinary legislation which established a special board to try bribery offenses. This tribunal was appointed by the Governor General on the advice of the Minister of Justice and not by the Judicial Services Commission which appointed judges. The Privy Council held that the bribery commissioners who had comprised the tribunal were judicial officers and the statutory provision requiring their appointment otherwise than by the Judicial Service Commission was inconsistent with the Constitution since it had not been passed in accordance with the prescribed constitutional amendment process. It was ultra-virus and invalid. You will find that many of the cases deal with the power to impose punishment. 
and the power to impose punishment on a particular person has long been held to be a judicial power. Thus, Blackstone in his commentaries in the Middle Ages said, therefore, a particular act of the legislature to confiscate the good of Titius or to attain him of high treason does not enter into the idea of a municipal law. For the operation of this act is spent upon Titus only and has no relation to the community in general. It is rather a sentence than a law. In the famous Jamaican case of Hines versus the Queen, which has been quoted throughout the Commonwealth, where the Gun Court Act established a revenue board, a review board, not comprised of judges, to fix the duration of sentences, the Privy Council held the provision to be unconstitutional on the basis that the constitutional provisions demonstrated the anxious care taken by the authors to make it abundantly clear that it was their intention that the judicial power of the state to be vested in the Supreme Court and in the other three organs of the judication. In this case, Lord Diplock stated, whatever is implicit in the very structure of a constitution on the Westminster model is that judicial power, however it be distributed from time to time between various courts, is to continue to be vested in persons appointed to hold judicial office in the manner under the terms laid down in the chapter dealing with the judicature, even though this is not expressly stated in the Constitution. In Law Society of Lesotho versus the Prime Minister, the Lesotho Court of Appeal held that appointing a member of the staff of the Director of Public Prosecutions as a temporary judge of the High Court was in contravention of the state's duty to guarantee the independence of the judiciary, since the DPP was one of the most frequent litigants before the High Court. The court treated the question as not one of personal intent, integrity, but of judicial independence and its appearance. In Hilton and Wells, the High Court of Australia was concerned with whether the separation of the judicial power was infringed by conferring on judges as individuals executive powers. The court held that while it was not while it was not permissible to confer a non-judicial power on a court unless it is merely ancillary or incidental to the exercise of judicial power, such power could be conferred on an individual who happens to be a member of the court. There were strong descending judgments, however, which stated that the separation of judicial and administrative power was not merely a matter of verbal formulae, but the nature of the functions cast upon judges should not be such as to prejudice their independence or conflict with the proper exercise of their judicial function. The case therefore demonstrates that care is needed in the appointment of judicial officers to administrative or executive positions or to granting them legislative powers where they, they are not ancillary to the judicial functions and they are identified by office rather than on a personal basis. In a Papua New Guinea case in 1993, the Supreme Court considered legislation dealing with an emergency situation and for the proscription of organizations. The certificate of the Commissioner of Police was made prima facie evidence of membership of such organization. An appeal from the proscription to the executive was provided for. The court held that the exclusion orders by the executive purported to grant a judicial function to the executive and therefore contravene the constituted separation of the judicial power. In an Antiguan Barbuda case, the Business License Act gave to the minister discretion to issue a license to a person to carry on his business or profession, where that person was already licensed to do so. The Court of Appeal of the Eastern Caribbean states then that it allowed the minister to consider himself the arbiter in social security or other disputes and to refuse to exercise his discretion to grant a license, thus interfering with a person's profession 
which was an important, although not guaranteed, right. The court held that this provision interfered with the judicial power and was therefore unconstitutional and void. I will next deal with uh, Antigua and Barbuda statute, where the Business License Act required persons engaged in any business or profession to obtain a license from the Register of Business. The Court of Appeal held that Section 10 of the Act was unconstitutional in that by providing that the Cabinet and not the Public Service Commission would appoint the Registrar of Business. It eroded the powers of the Public Service Commission to make public service appointments under the Constitution. The Court stated that the supremacy of the Constitution and the doctrine of the separation of powers were integral to the Constitution. The effect of the new certification regime was to transfer to the executive the judicial power since it affected the right of a person to practice his profession, which though not a fundamental right, ought to be zealously protected. The discretionary power granted the minister to issue a license to practice was ultra various and void as interfering with the judicial power. Another case dealing with the judicial power, the Cayman Court of Appeal in the Ides, held that the youth justice law was in conflict with the principles underlying the Cayman Constitution, as it gave the governor, who had no judicial powers or responsibilities, the power to determine the length of sentence for an offender below the age of 18, who would otherwise be liable to life imprisonment. The Constitution, based upon the Westminster model, had as its foundation the separation of powers of the executive, legislative, and judicial arms of government, assigned sentencing power to the judiciary. Nevertheless, a custodial sentence was appropriate due to the seriousness of the offense and had been lawfully imposed. The only breach of the Constitution was that the appellant had been sentenced to detention during Her Majesty's pleasure, and this would be rectified by ordering instead that he be detained during the court's pleasure. I will deal next with the Trinidad case. Yes, Ferguson. The Privy Council considered a statute which repealed an earlier statutory limitation period for the institution of criminal proceeding. There were at least 47 current prosecutions which were affected by the amendment. The Privy Council held that the legislation which altered the law applicable in current legal proceedings was capable of violating the principle of the separation of powers and the rule of law by interfering with the administration of justice, but only where the legislation did not simply affect the resolution of current litigation, but was ad hominem, that is targeted at identifiable persons or cases. The least that had to be shown was that the statute was directed at identifiable people or groups of people. This was after the uh, insurrection or the uh, assault on the parliament. Legislation might be framed in general terms as an alteration of the law and yet be targeted in that way. The test was objective. It did not depend on an analysis of its political motivation. It depended on the effect of the statute as a matter of construction and on an examination of the categories of case to which, viewed at the time it was passed, it could be expected to apply. In the instant case, immediately before 2012 Act had been passed, the appellants enjoyed under Section 34 a vest of the 2011 Act a vested legal right not to be tried in the criminal proceedings which had been brought against them, and on application to the High Court to be discharged and have a verdict of not guilty entered in their favor. The effect of the subsequent 2012 Act was there to, therefore to remove an accused from an accused and unanswerable defense. 
It followed that the challenge to the act could only succeed on that ground if it was shown that the terms, although framed generally, would in practice apply only to a limited category of people, including the appellants against whom it could be said to have been targeted. And so on that case, it was held to be unconstitutional. In a Dominican case, I'm trying to give an example from different countries, so the final one on the judiciary is from Dominica, where a right was given to the director of public prosecutions to appeal against an acquittal. The Privy Council held that while the Constitution of Dominica, like other modern Commonwealth constitutions, recognized the separation of powers, there was nothing in the Constitution required that every exercise of judicial power should be discretionary in nature or that a court appellate or otherwise could not be directed by a statute to take a particular course in particular circumstances. The predominance of the litigation in respect of the doctrine of separation of powers has therefore been in relation to the protection of the judicial power. Nevertheless, as we have seen, even the separation is not absolute. And so I now make some concluding remarks. The doctrine of separation of powers is given greater protection in the written constitution of Commonwealth countries than by the unwritten British constitution. In a case in 1995, Lord Mustill said, it is a feature of the peculiarly British conception of the separation of powers that parliament, the executive, and the courts have each their distinct and largely exclusive domain. Parliament has a legally unchallengeable right to make whatever laws it thinks right. The executive carries on the administration of the country in accordance with the powers conferred on it by law. The courts interpret the laws and see that they are obeyed. This requires the courts on occasions to step into the territory which belongs to the executive to verify not only that the powers asserted accord with the substantive law created by Parliament, but also that the manner in which they are exercised conforms with the standards of fairness which the Parliament must have intended. Concurrently with this judicial fu pa function, Parliament has its own special means of ensuring that the executive in the exercise of delegated functions performs in a way which Parliament finds appropriate. Ideally, it is in these latter methods which should be used to check executive errors and excesses. For it is the task of Parliament and the executive in tandem, not of the courts, to govern the country. In recent years, however, the employment in practice of these specifically parliamentary remedies has on occasion been perceived as falling short, and sometimes well short, of what was needed to bring the performance of the executive into line with the law and with the minimum standards of fairness implicit in every parliamentary delegation of a decision-making function. To avoid a vacuum in which the citizen will be left without protection against a misuse of executive powers, the courts have had no option but to occupy the dead ground in a manner and in areas of public life which could not have been foreseen 30 years ago. For myself, I'm quite satisfied that this unprecedented judicial role has been greatly been to the public benefit. Nevertheless, it has its risks, of which the courts are well aware. As the judges themselves constantly remark, it is not that they were appointed to administer the country. I've sent a written constitution, most sensitivity is required of the parliamentarians, administrators, and judges if the delicate balance of the unwritten rules evolve. I believe, I believe successfully in recent years is not to be disturbed and all the recent advances undone. In a keynote address at the 2012 UCCI 5050 conference, published in the West Indian Law Journal, Honorable Chief Justice Anthony Smiley, in referring to the 50 years of the Cornwall Caribbean independence movement, stated, that remarkable process of constitutional advancement resulted in systems of government under the rule of law which enshrined the Constitution 
including the Bills of Rights as the supreme law. It entrenched the doctrine of the separation of powers in a manner that the Westminster Parliament, even while exporting the concept of the written constitution to the newly independent state, had not itself yet fully achieved. In reference to the reforms in the structure of judiciary of the United Kingdom and the method of appointment of judges, the learned Chief Justice remarked, this independent process for the appointment of the judges was another way in which the United Kingdom's constitution was catching up with those that had been successfully exported to the rest of the Commonwealth. The historic decision of the United Supreme Court, of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, in the case against the Prime Minister in 2019, is a historic demonstration of the statue of the judiciary in the architecture of parliamentary system. It also suggests that the constitutionalism of the Commonwealth, which has been influenced by their written constitution, is pervading the, juris the jurisprudence of the unwritten British constitution. The question concerned the lawfulness of the advice given by the head of the executive, the prime minister, to the former head of the parliament, Her Majesty the Queen, that parliament in the midst of the controversial Brexit transition should be prorogued at a particular time. It was argued that the court had no jurisdiction to adjudicate in the matter, as the matter was political and not justiciable. The court held, firstly, that the prime minister had a constitutional responsibility in giving his advice to have regard to all relevant interests, including the interests of parliament. Secondly, the fact that a legal dispute concerns the conduct of politics or arises from a political controversy does not preclude the court from considering it, as most constitutional cases have been concerned with politics in that sense. Thirdly, the Prime Minister's accountability to Parliament does not in itself justify the conclusion that the courts have no legitimate role to play, as the effect of the prorogation is to prevent the operation of ministerial accountability to Parliament during the prorogation, and courts have a duty to give effect to the law, irrespective of the minister's political accountability to Parliament. Ministerial responsibility is not a substitute for judicial review. The purported exercise of a priority for may not only be open to legal challenge on the ground that it does not exist, or is exercised outside its limits, but also whether its exercise within its limit is open to legal challenge on the grounds of judicial review. Whether the law recognizes the existence of a prerogative power or its limits are questions of law for the court under the doctrine of the separation of powers. Prerogative powers are limited to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, and an unlimited power of prerogative would be incompatible with the legal principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary accountability is no less fundamental to the Westminster system than parliamentary sovereignty. As Lord Bingham of Cornell said, the conduct of government by a prime minister and cabinet, collectively responsible and accountable to parliament, lies at the heart of the Westminster democracy. Ministers are accountable to parliament through such mechanisms as their duty to answer parliamentary questions and to appear before parliamentary committees. And through parliamentary scrutiny of the delegated legislation which ministers make, by these means the policies of the executive are subjected to consideration by the representatives of the electorate. The executive is required to report, explain, and defend its actions, and citizens are protected from the arbitrary exercise of executive power. It was also stated that the relevant limit on the power to parole can be expressed in this way. That a decision to prorogue parliament or advise the monarch to prorogue parliament will be unlawful if the prorogation has the effect of frustrating or preventing, without reasonable justification, the ability of parliament to carry out its constitutional function as a legislature and as a body responsible for the supervision of the executive. If 
In such a situation, the court will intervene if the effect is sufficiently serious to justify such an exceptional course. In a democratic country, it is the responsibility of the judiciary and the political leaders, as well as the electorate, to ensure that the basic architectural structure is not compromised by ensuring that the foundation of electoral integrity, free speech, and individual liberty are sustained, and that the mechanisms of accountability and transparency which underpin them are constantly reinforced and enhanced. The formal structural separation of powers does not by itself reflect the reality of controlling power. It is in the basic political alignment and the influence of political morality that the checks and balances essentially reside. Whether it is the president in the presidential system or prime minister in the parliamentary system, it is the leader's control of the party organization philosophy and objectives is inordinate. Democracy becomes susceptible to failure and dictatorship becomes a substantial threat. A basic culture of democracy is therefore essential to the maintenance of the principle that each of the organs of government and each wield of power respects the importance of the others, whether separated or interconnected. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of this edifice, in which one of the organs of Cayman democracy resides, its members, past, present, and future, must reinforce their commitment to the preservation and enhancement of the spirit rather than the letter of the doctrine of the separation of powers and thereby ensure the preservation of democracy and the rule of law. Thanks for your patience. Dr. Burnett, I just want to, on behalf of our members of parliament, the honorable speaker, those gathered in the chamber today, and indeed those who are listening by way of our live broadcast, to just express my sincere gratitude. I know the deputy premier mentioned that you are indeed a renowned jurist and constitutional scholar, but we witness here tonight the depth of your understanding of these issues, and indeed, we closely followed um, where the doctrine of the separation of powers was not just expounded, but how it continues to come under tension and be clarified through the courts. Um, several of those cases involving our local courts as well, and we were all listening to see if we could remember who was involved in those, so <laughs> thank you so much for that, sir. I am told that our two presenters are going to stay with us through the evening. And as they are graciously going to be a part of our gathering this evening, Mr. Barton locked eyes with me, so I'm not sure if he was just told, but <laughs> as it is, it's all good among friends, sir. <laughs> And so um, we will not have any questions at this time because I, uh, I am also advised that there is a significant gathering of friends outside awaiting the arrival of this group so that the celebrations to commemorate our 50th anniversary of a parliament building might also be observed. So please just let me say again our sincere gratitude and I am sure you will have persons wanting to bend your ear as we exit the building um, with the questions that they had. Apologies for those who are holding questions but certainly please do not be shy and um, certainly use this opportunity to speak with Dr. Barnett and Mr. Barton through the course of the evening. So without further ado, I would like to continue with the evening's program and invite the Chief Officer and Clerk of Parliament, Mrs. Zena Marin-Chin, to make a presentation to our guest speakers, Dr. Barnett and Mr. Barton. Ms. Zena. Thank you, Ms. Gloria. Dr. Barnett, on behalf of the Parliament, 
the Honourable Speaker and the staff, all the parliamentarians, and everybody here that's actually had the privilege of listening to your lecture this evening. We want to present to you a small token of appreciation for you coming to the Cayman Islands and providing us with this very interesting lecture. Um, and we hope that this will not be the last time that you're actually here to impart your vast knowledge um, on to the Cayman Islands and um, all of us that's here. So thank you very much. I know we actually have a vote of thanks coming up, but I wanted to personally thank you and to provide you with a small token of our appreciation. Thank, thank you. you yes, sir. I'm going to pop around. Mr. Richard, again, small token of appreciation. Thank you very much for participating and providing us with local perspective on this very interesting topic. Um, and again, I hope that you will be a part of all the other lectures that we are going to be organizing. And we thank you very much for helping us this evening. Thank you. And the words you were hoping to hear this evening. To conclude tonight's program, I would invite the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, the Honorable Catherine E. Banks Wilkes, to offer the vote of thanks. Protocol having been established, it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge and recognize the persons, parties, and entities who played an instrumental role to make this 50th anniversary of the Parliament building a success, particularly this lecture component on the separation of powers. Firstly, I would like to thank Madam Master of Ceremonies for her poise, usual eloquence, and formal display as she conducted her role with grace this evening. Thank you for also ensuring that the ceremony was followed according to the program. I would also like to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Roy McTaggart for the prayer and for, for the invitation um, for the presence of the Lord to commence our proceedings. This event was the brainchild of our own Speaker of the House, Dr. Honorable McKeeva Bush. The Honorable Speaker deserves a special thank you for formulating and spearheading the committee and offering leadership and direction. <laughs> Speaker Bush gave direction whilst also ensuring that all were consulted. We are grateful for the speaker's foresight and vision for this parliament, considering this lecture series is one of its kind and the first. With his visionary thoughts, energy, drive, and experience, we are all clearly in good hands here in the house with the honorable speaker. This historic perspective he brings is unbelievably enlightening and fascinating. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your welcome remarks and providing context for the event. Based on the fundamental principle, no man is an island, we know this successful lecture took cooperation and a team effort of the committee to have arranged such a dynamic lecture. The committee was chaired by the Honorable Speaker and the members primarily comprised of and included the Honorable Kenneth Bryan, Honorable J. E. Banks, Honorable Sir Alden McLaughlin, Ms. Heather Bodden, Mr. Joseph Hugh, our Dare Master of Ceremonies, Ms. Gloria McPhiel Nixon, Ms. Zena Chin, sorry, Marin Chin, Mr. Garfield Ellison, Mr. Samuel Rose, Mr. Alfonso Wright, Ms. Marzita Bodden, and Ms. Pat Ulet. The committee did a sterling job in making all this materialize tonight. Committee members, we thank you for all of your hard work. We 
We are fortunate to be graced here this evening with the presence of our two distinguished guest lecturers. Our sincere gratitude to our parliamentary secretary, Ms. Heather Bodden, for introducing Mr. Richard Barton, and also our honorable deputy premier for graciously introducing our guest speaker. Both lectures have been educational and enlightening and we thank Mr. Barton for providing an insightful local perspective on the separation of powers, specific to the Cayman Islands context. Mr. Barton has provided a greater understanding to our local dynamics in a constitutional and practical framework. There are obvious lessons to be learned and contemplated based on Mr. Barton's impressive presentation. You've unpacked and dissected the local issues in an intelligible fashion for most of us to comprehend. Your analysis was helpful for our local perspective. And it was in this vein that the Parliament Management Act that has been amended since its introduction and will, under and will undergo further changes to keep abreast, reflect and aligned with Parliament's new strategic direction one of which is embracing separation of powers doctrines and ensuring it manifests in substance and form. You've also accurately and distinctively described the three co-equal branches of government and their respective functions. And an exceptional thanks to you, Mr. Barton. I'm sure that this historic lecture has been enlightening to many of our residents and will be relied on in the future. Last, but by no means least, is our established and renowned guest speaker, Dr. Barnett. It is worthy to first thank you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule to give us this comparative analysis and instructive lecture on the separation of powers without a cost to the government. We are deeply indebted to you as you did this out of the goodness of your heart. It is clear, sir, that you took a lot of time to prepare for this presentation this evening. And I'm happy that it has been recorded. I'm sure that many of us will rely on it in the future. Your measured and well-tempered delivery gave a description and characterization on the separation of powers, and it will, and it was impeccably done and was relevant. The accurate reflection of what existed and has evolved in certain jurisdictions and in case law will be undoubtedly helpful to us. You brought better compre comprehension to the doctrines relating to the separation of powers. So we are very pleased to have hosted you and thank you for such a profound and thoughtful presentation. I was told to let you know specifically that your usual caller asks for your forgiveness for calling you at some odd hours, whether it's late evening, night times, early morning times, or on a Sunday in order to ensure things are in order for your visit and lecture. Thank you also, sir, for your patience and tolerance. And you are a true and committed educator to the people. Special thanks to the Clerk of Parliament for her presentation to our guest speakers. May I say finally to the staff of Parliament, we thank you for your exceptional work we know you have worked tirelessly to get this event to where it is this evening, and especially the preparation of this booklet, which gives an overview of the historic perspective of the parliament. I also would like to thank the Department of Communications, who also played a vital and essential role in broadcasting this event. A big thank you to the Department of Communications for your supportive role. I would also like to thank everyone here this evening for attending, especially the families of our lecturers. I know that some of them are here in the chambers today. Your presence here means a lot to us and we trust that you have found this lecture beneficial and educational. Now let's partake with foods and refreshments outdoors. Madam Master of Ceremonies, thank you again. Thank you so very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. You are so gracious and 
Thank you for recognizing everyone, including the team. I know that is your way, and we are all very appreciative of that. Thank you for the vote of thanks. As the Honorable Deputy Speaker has said, I am now the only person standing between you and entertainment, food, and drink, which is not a good place to be. <laughs> so I'm going to exit this position and invite you to exit these chambers. This concludes the lecture portion of the evening. Tonight's attendees are invited to depart the Parliament building and to be seated outdoors in order to commence this ceremony commemorating the 50th anniversary of our Parliament building. The guest speakers, members of Parliament, and other persons in the chamber will be escorted out of the building first to be followed by members of the audience sitting in the galley above the chambers. The staff of the Parliament will indicate when each section should move over to the celebration outdoors. Good evening, everyone, and thank you again.